Hell, of course, is the most hated truth in the world today. Most gospel ministers don't preach about it. Many gospel preachers don't believe it anymore. Even in some Pentecostal circles, they don't believe there is a hell. They say it's incompatible with the preaching of God's love. They say, how can uh, a God of mercy send anybody to a burning pit of everlasting hell? But Jesus was the very first to warn of hell. He said, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus warned Capernaum, Bethsaida, and everyone who would reject his word, he said, you shall be brought down to hell. Jesus said, you serpents, generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus was the greatest preacher on hell in all this living word. Now let me try to explain to you from the word of God what hell is going to be like. Now let me start by saying that when I preached this message for the first time here in New York City, a young man was visiting from uh, Canada and he had a, a, a body suit on, flesh-colored body suit. The only flesh he had was in his hands and his face. He had been burned over 90% of his body. He had been one of 10, uh, 12 men on an oil rig in Canada when it caught fire. Now just two weeks prior to this, he had, he had joined this uh, oil team and he was on this rig and when they go back after all day work, they went back to the bunkhouse and he was mocked and ridiculed because he's a good, strong Christian. He really loved the Lord. And he was particularly harassed by a young man on, on the job who just night and day said, I don't want to hear any of this Jesus garbage. I don't want to hear anything you have to say about it. And he's the kind of one that boasted, well, when I die, just before I die, I'll get right with God. And folks, this is why this message has to be preached. Some people have the idea, well, even if there is a hell, at the last moment, somehow I'll cry out to God. He'll have mercy and he'll save me. The mockery went on for two weeks. This young man made up his mind the next day to quit. He said, I can't handle this mockery anymore. About to leave, but the night, the, just that night before he was to quit, there was an explosion on the oil rig. I think there were three who were killed instantly. Uh, the rest were burned, uh, different parts. This boy was burned 90% of his body. And, and uh, he heard the screaming and the flesh burning. And, he, he, he was running himself, but he saw this young man who had mocked him so much, and he saw him on fire, and he pulled him away from the blaze, and he was nothing, honestly, charcoal, he said, his hands frozen up, he had uh, nothing left but his eyeballs, his ears were gone, his nose was gone, everything was gone. Did he cry out to God? He said, well, listen, I'll tell you why your message so stirred me tonight. And why I, out of all the times I had to be here this night, and that's why I don't understand who God sent here to hear this tonight. But you know what his last words were? He didn't say, forgive me for mocking you. He didn't say one thing. He, he knows he's about to die. You know what he said? Do I still have a nose? He was worried about his nose. He couldn't breathe. Instantly died. This young man burned over 90% of his body. He said, Brother David, you, they gave me morphine. They gave me every kind of drugs. And for, for three months, I was in hell. I, I tasted. I could feel it. And God made it real to me. He said, I know there's a hell. I know there's a hell. Nobody can tell me any different. Let me tell you what I believe it's going to be like. The Bible says, first of all, it's going to be a kingdom of total darkness, both literally and spiritually. His kingdom was full of darkness. That's Lucifer's kingdom. Now, the Bible said in God's kingdom, there's no need for, there'll be no night there. There's no need of a candle, no light of the sun. For the Lord God shall give the light. Jesus Christ will shine in his glory. He's the light of those in heaven. The city says, no need of the sun, nor the moon the, to shine. For the glory of the Lord does light it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Hallelujah. Hell is eternal darkness, not a speck of light. And it'll be so tormenting, so suffocating... And this is going to be a darkness created by God. Created by God. They will gnaw their tongues for pain. Jude warned, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. There's a darkness that cannot be defined by human reasoning. Peter said, a mist of darkness reserved forever. It's a mist that God has created that falls upon those in eternal hell. There was a darkness, remember, in Egypt. 
even a darkness which could be felt. It was a thick darkness. They didn't even move. They didn't even move in their house. The darkness was so thick they couldn't see anywhere in front of them. It was a darkness that was felt. Can you imagine the darkness, the literal darkness in hell? No one, you say, well, if there's fire, there's light. Not the liquid fire that God has created in hell. There's no light to that fire whatsoever. Jesus warned the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. More than that, it's a spiritual darkness. Outer darkness describes being cast further and further away from God. Now, folks, I don't know where hell is. Some people claim it's in the heart of the earth. The Bible said there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't want my new earth to be encased in the bosom of a hell. I don't want hell in the middle of a new earth. It's impossible. No, I believe God's created, he will create a special planet. And when judgment comes and they are carried away by the angels, bound hand and foot, and cast into outer darkness, they're cast into this planet. And when God has finally finished the judgments, he will fling it into an outer cosmos, and all through eternity it will drift further and further away from the light. Jesus is the light. Hell will be a continual, everlasting, drifting into a black darkness, cast into outer darkness. That's why I say I, he's going to fling that planet into total outer darkness. And there will be a sense to everyone in hell that they're drifting further and further away from God. Now, the only thing that gives any comfort to any sinner in New York or any place on this planet today is the fact that God's people are still here, the Holy Ghost is still here and working. You take the Holy Ghost out of the earth right now, it'd be a hell right here on earth. There is comfort. The Holy Ghost is a comforter. And even the sinners, wicked sinners, they don't know it, but they're feeling that sense of safety and comfort. They don't feel the sense of danger because the Holy Ghost is still here. The Holy Ghost will be torn away. There'll be no spirit. There'll be no life. This will be an eternal knowledge of ever drifting from the presence and the light of God. The, away from every Christian who gives joy, cheer, anything that has to do with happiness, cheer, and joy, all gone. This will be a world of transgressors, of child molesters, and of Hitlers and Mussolinis and all of the dictators. It will be a world, the Bible said, numbered with the transgressors. Numbered. Can you imagine waking up in that kind of company and looking around and there's nothing but sinners, nothing but the ungodly, and you are numbered among the transgressors. Backsliders and compromisers on earth, the, the thought of God, of holiness and purity is going to die. Men are going to prefer darkness. Now listen to this, please. Believing a lie, reprobated, made to believe that heaven with the Lord would be worse than even hell. Now, listen to me, please. You may not believe this, but everything in the Scripture proves it. I used to believe that if in hell God came with an offer to, to come, I, I forgive you, enter the gates of heaven, it would not be accepted by one person in hell. In spite of the torments, in spite of what hell is, the Bible said men prefer darkness rather than light. And men will believe a lie, and the devil will have them so deceived that they would believe. Don't believe it. It's a trick. That light that he's talking about is going to be worse than you have here, and the total deception will be that even if God offered it, it would not be accepted. Now, hell is more than just being abandoned or forsaken by God. The Bible said those in hell are going to suffer the vengeance of God. The flaming fire taking vengeance, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now listen to this, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. For we know him, he said, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, saith the Lord, for it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Lord. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now, those that are in hell are not in the hands of the devil. They're in the hands of an angry God. And he turned, now, just think for a moment. Satan himself is going to be tormented night and day. We, we, we have the idea that Satan's going to be the tormentor. He's going to be tormented himself night and day all through eternity. He's going to be occupied with his own torment. The devil was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, and he shall be tormented day and night. Revelation 20.10. But you see, this word vengeance is retaliation. God said, I'm going to repay. 
Now what kind of vengeance, what kind of payday for mockers and scoffers like those who, who produce these movies like The Last Temptation of Christ and the mockery of Jesus Christ? I, I, I can't even conceive in my mind the kind of vengeance that God will have prepared. If God can just speak a world and the world is destroyed by a flood, if he merely breathes his breath and fire falls on the whole population of Sodom and Gomorrah, if he just speaks a word and dust turns into lice, and he speaks a word and serpents cover the wilderness, and Egyptians are covered with boils, and all of that when God's anger was restrained. That wasn't the wrath of God. It was just a touch. Could you imagine what his wrath would be? The Bible says that those who are in hell are going to have special bodies prepared, instruments of unrighteousness. They're going to prepare bodies, instruments of unrighteousness, instruments of destruction. God, even though we get a new body, there will be a new body for those who are cast into hell, an eternal body that cannot be consumed. It has a worm that will never die and explain what that worm is at the conclusion of my message. Hell is a place of rage and hatred toward God. But here's what men are going to do. Men, when they were scorched with great heat, they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, but they repented not to give him glory. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, and they repented not of their deeds. You go to Roosevelt Hospital up here. You go to this uh, hospital just two blocks from here. What's the name of that? St. Clair's. It's all, all AIDS now. And you go in there, the AIDS ward, like I have many times. And you'll see the most hatred for God you've ever seen by men and women with AIDS. They're about to die and they curse God. You will hear more cursing of those they have been plagued and they will curse God. Now I'm talking, I'm not talking about homophiliacs. I'm not talking about those who, who, who got it uh, without in, being involved themselves into gross sin. But those who've been in gross sin and they're, they're suffering the vengeance, they have an anger toward God. Even though they're about to look God in the face, there's an anger there. Even on the streets, I've seen men dying with AIDS, banging their heads against the stone, against the curb, and cursing God. There's no, been, there's no repentance. Do you think men will repent if they won't repent with the restrained anger of God? Are they going to repent when the full anger of God comes? I asked the Holy Spirit to show me what was the greatest cause of torment in hell. And I was shocked at the, re at the answer he gave me. Why are they going to be railing and gnashing and gritting their teeth? Why this, why this terrible rage in hell? Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The greatest torment in hell is going to be the cross of Jesus Christ. Because it's an offense. Here, now, in time, can you imagine the offense it will be in hell when the whole story is told? When they, in eternity, standing before the judgment, learn how simple the cross was, how simple grace was, and all the good deeds and charitable works and self-will created a sense of false security? The Jews will say, I kept 613 commandments. I went to synagogue, I washed my hands, I washed my pots, I washed my pans, I studied the Torah, I studied it all. And then to have this revelation that Jesus said, just look and live. It was so simple. Millions of Iranian young people, almost two million of them, that listened to the promises of the Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini, Khomeini who said, if you'll pray five times, if you will rush in against the Iraqis, I guarantee you paradise. They were told that they'll have all the liquor they can drink and all the beautiful women all through eternity. And those 15, 16 year olds died by the, by the hundreds of thousands. Can you imagine when they wake up in hell? When they wake up and learn the truth of the cross of Jesus Christ that was offered so simply and so freely, they will curse God. You made it too easy. It was too simple. I was tricked. And many of you that heard the God, you, some of you have heard enough gospel to save China. <laughs> and we preach the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. You hear it in radio, television, every you got it coming out your ears. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you go, when you wake up in eternal hell and remember the simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ? That's the torment. 
I missed something, so some, if it had been hard, you could explain it or you could excuse it in your mind, but you can't excuse the simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ through an eternity. And for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Satan will rage forever because the cross cost him his power, put him to open shame and destroy this kingdom. They're going to rage, shake their fist against the cross of Jesus Christ. And all through eternity it was too obvious, it was too simple. How could I have known it was so simple? Now there's some other aspects about hell I want to talk about. It's a place where men's lust will burn forever and never be satisfied. Now this is hard for us to comprehend, but I want you to think about it for just a minute. The lust that now indulges the sinner is going to burn worse through hell. These bodies fitted for destruction will still be lusting away in hell. You say, well, how could there be a lust problem in hell when there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? You explained to me how Rock Hudson, who knew he was dying with AIDS and still skin and bone, got on an airplane from Los Angeles and went to the bars in San Francisco and was still connecting just before he died, still connecting with homosexuals in gay bars about to die. He's still burning in his lust. There are men walking like skeletons out here. Walking skeletons, still trying to work a trick. I saw a woman being carried into a hospital in, in uh, Houston. She's being operated on for uh, cancer in her lungs. I think uh, one lung had been removed and they're working on another and she had a, a little hole they'd cut in her throat here so she could breathe. And they're wheeling her, her husband's following her into the operating room and I'm standing there. I think Debbie was being operated there at MD Anderson Hospital. And she turns to her husband and she says, smoke, smoke. And he likes a cigarette. She holds it to the the hole and sucks it in through the hole. I'm standing there in total disbelief. She, she, she may not even survive the operation, but smoke. <laughs> Sucking it through a hole in her neck. It's going to be hell. The lust will rage and can't be satisfied. The Bible said hell's a lake of fire. Five times the scripture calls hell a lake of fire, a fire which burneth. Unknown like, you know God has elements that we don't know anything about. So don't try to figure it out by human elements that exist today. This, these are elements, supernatural elements. It has no light. Elements we know nothing about. The Bible said men shall seek death there and won't be able to find it. Hell, the Bible said, will never end. It's everlasting. You can't, if you stop and think that God never was and never will be ended, you, if you stop any day and try to stretch your mind back as far as you can go and find there's no beginning of God, you can go crazy. I don't do that. God had no beginning, he has no end. It's a circle. You can't find any cut in it. But a Puritan tried to describe what eternity is going to be like. He said, suppose the whole earth 25,000 miles in circumference was a ball of sand, 25,000 mile ball of sand. And once every million years, a little bird came in from the cosmos and took away one grain of sand. It would take billions of years to fill a cup and eternity would just be beginning. It would just be starting. Our minds can't conceive the everlastingness of hell. We can't even calculate it. Now, who's going there? The Bible says the majority of mankind is going to hell. The disciples said, Lord, are there few that will be saved? Jesus said, enter at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction or to hell. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that are going to find it. Now you think of New York City and 16 million people, and most of them are going to hell. 
Paul visited the New York City of his time, Athens. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city holy, the whole city given over to idolatry. Athens went to hell. Rome went to hell. All the great cities, the Sodom, Gomorrah, all the cities that have gone to hell. New York is going to hell. The majority are going to hell. I thank God that he, we're one of many lights he's raised up here in New York City, especially this bright light right on Broadway, because the Lord's, just like he's standing at the gates of hell, where men are falling into hell, he's, he's, he's established his arms stretched out by you and me. We are here at Broadway, stretched out his arms and says, Come, look and live, don't go this way. God's trying to push back the hordes that are rushing into hell. In Noah's day, how many were saved? Eight. Lot, his wife and two girls. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in darkness, John said. And I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the majority of nominal churchgoers are going to hell. Many, many people are going to hell who, who are so blinded they are not living for God. They can tell you they got saved some far, sometime way back. They, they, they may have even joined a church and shaken hands with somebody. But they're not living for God. When we think of hell, we think of those going there are the obvious. The Bible said the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. The Bible said, whoever is not written in the book of life, whosoever is not found in the, written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The only people who are saved are those whose names are written in the book of life. There's a great white throne judgment and there's a book. The Bible said, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. The books were open. Now the book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. Jesus made this promise. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed with white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. I'll confess his name before my Father and all his angels. Do you know your name's written in the book of life tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. They're going, you see, in hell, and this is something the Holy Spirit showed me, and I've never heard it from any body anywhere in the world. Holy Spirit revealed it to me. That when Christians get to heaven, you don't suddenly get everything that heaven is. It's not static. You don't suddenly get the full revelation of Jesus. You don't say, well, I've arrived and suddenly you get all the glory. No, heaven is an ever-increasing glory. All through eternity, it's going to get better and better, richer and richer. Jesus is going to become more and more real, more light. We're going to learn all through eternity, and we'll never get it all. All through eternity, we're still learning, still being blessed. The joy is going to be ever greater. The ecstasy is going to grow and grow and grow. You don't get it all when you get there. You just start. And you will have an ever-increasing knowledge of being saved, an ever-increasing knowledge of joy. He will wipe out all memory of those on this earth so that there will be no suffering over your unsaved loved ones. But in hell, there's also an ever-increasing knowledge of damnation and being lost and being cast further and further away from God. And there'll be an ever-increasing knowledge of what was missed. There, it's not steady. You suddenly get to hell and that's, that's it. This is the torment and it stays at this level. No, there's an ever-increasing torment, an ever-increasing knowledge that you are lost, an ever-increasing uh, uh, sense of being cast away from the presence of God for an eternity. Well, there's going to be a surprise multitude in hell, though. The biggest multitude in hell will be in shock. Those who went to hell because of the sin of neglect, they just neglected. Just didn't take the time. They just neglected. How should we escape damnation if we neglect so great a salvation? You did not lay these things to your heart, neither did you remember the latter end. You're given to pleasures, you're living carelessly, therefore evil shall come upon you. You will not be able to stop it, desolation shall come suddenly. Isaiah 47, 7 to 11. You didn't lay it to heart. You heard it and dismissed it. All of, there are going to be a number of you walk out of here tonight and you're going to forget everything I said except the last part I'm going to give you in just a few moments because you'll never forget it. I'm, God, by Spirit, going to burn it into your brain because He loves you. 
I'm, I'm not railing at you. I'm not jumping all over the stage. I'm just standing here calmly telling you that there is a living hell, everlasting hell. Now let me tell you how I see it. Now folks, God gave me this first. I hear preachers all of America using this now. I've heard it on radio. They don't even tell where they got it from my tape. I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you that I saw this and it shook me up and I'll never be the same. It's called instant replay. It's called the worm that never dies. And that's your conscience. The conscience. Can you imagine waking up in hell? Can you imagine the touch of eternal death on your shoulder? and the stench and the feel of a darkness that I've described to you and then to hear the roar of the adversary your mind eternally and the sense of being lost and this sense of being ever more cast away from the presence of God I don't think it's uh, in my limited vocabulary. I can't describe to you what it's going to be like for a person to suddenly be in hell. I am in hell. I am lost. Now, if, 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 if you could say to this person, well, 10 million years from now, you get a week's break, they may endure it. Or they said, this could last billions of years, but at the end, you'll have a little bit of hope. But there's no hope, no other chance. I am in hell. And then suddenly, the worm turns, the conscience. Because you will remember every service you've been in. You remember every scripture that was ever quoted to you. You will remember every wooing of the Holy Spirit. You will relive it and live it. You will relive my message. The message I preach right now, I preached in Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago to about 8,000 people. And I screamed over the microphone, you will hear me preach this through eternity. And a shockwave went through that stadium. And I say the same to you. You will hear it. Every message you've ever heard, every radio sermon, every witness you've had, Every song that you've heard or sung, everything that had to do with Christ or his gospel, you will replay it. The conscience will turn. That's the worm that never dies. That's the conscience. That's the memory. Oh, yes, there's a memory in hell. You will remember it all. And suddenly, as this worm turns, I believe the worm means that a man will go between time and eternity. He drifts back and forth for quite a while before he realizes what's happened until the worm has finished his work. This worm will turn and suddenly the lights go on and suddenly there's light and he wakes up and he's back in his living room at home. And there's a Billy Graham special on television and his little girl is playing with a doll and he can't believe it. He pinches himself. He, he, he said, I'm, I'm alive. I can't be in hell. And his wife is in the kitchen and he sees her and he says, honey, quick, come in. And she's bringing her a cup of coffee. He said, honey, put the coffee down. Please, on the coffee table, i got to talk to you. I'm having some kind of incredible, I must have drunk something, something's wrong. I have had a fit. I was in hell. I had a dream I was in hell. I had a nightmare. Please tell me I'm alive. And she passes it. You okay? Here, drink your coffee. And he fills the warm coffee. He said, I'm alive. And Billy Graham is saying, come to Jesus. And he says, quick, on your knees. And he gets down on his knees and he's about to cry, Jesus. And he can't get the word out because just as he's about to get the words out and feel the warmth and the peace of the gospel of Jesus flood his soul, it goes dark and he wakes up. He's in hell. He said, it wasn't a dream. I'm in hell. I'm lost. And he said, oh God, never again. Don't send me back into time. A little while goes by and his lights go on again. The worm is turning. This time he's back in church. He's sitting 
in the same seat that he once sat. And he's reliving a gospel message. He's singing, and he's sitting there stunned, and he looks around, he said, if this is a nightmare, if someone has put drug in my drink, God, let me wake up. That man screams, God, don't let me go to hell. He's screaming, save me. The preacher's trying to preach. He's screaming at the top of his voice, and he's looking around at him. He's looking at the lights. He's counting the people. He's looking at the colors of their clothes, and he's pinching himself. He's pulling his ears. He's pulling his hair. He wants to feel, and he feels the pain. He says, how can I be dead? Or how can I be eternally dead? How can I be in hell? When I feel the pain, I hear his voice. Oh, God, I can't take it anymore. And he runs down the aisle and he throws himself on his knees. This time, Jesus, I've got to get through. He gets the word Jesus out. And he's about to raise his hands and cry, Have mercy, but he can't get it out because it goes black. And he says, No, God, I'm in hell. I am in hell. He's got to go all through eternity, reliving every scene until finally... It's dragged in, and he sits through it, and it's nothing but torment, because he said, I wake up in a moment, and there's no relief, and all it is is added torment, and all through eternity. Sinner, I'm going to tell you something, backslider. You walk out on God, you're going to be back in this seat a billion, billion times. Back and forth, back and forth. And never be able to utter the word Jesus. Never be able to repent. Because the worm never dies. Never dies. Now you said, well, were you trying to scare me? You know what Peter said? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If I saw you in a building down Lower East Side, and it's on fire, and you're up there, and, and you're just sitting there, on a flat roof and you're sunning yourself and there's a fire down there do you think I'm just going to stand there and say I think it'd be a good idea if you got off that roof I'd go fire and I'm streaming fire you never heard hell preached in 35 minutes But I'll tell you what really saddens me more than anything else. I think the worst torment of all has to be those who are going to be tormented with opportunities lost and missed, just like tonight. So, Brother Dave, wouldn't the love of Jesus be better? This is the love of Jesus. He loves you so much that he would bring you to a service and change the pastor's message just to reach you. Just to reach you. I'm an evangelist at heart and a pastor. But God knew you'd be here. Set you right in this seat. And you may think it's thunder and a piercing sword but it's nothing but his arms reaching out to embrace you, saying, I'm warning you in love while there's time. I'm warning you. Now, for those that are flaunting your sin in the face of God, he's warned you time and time again, don't play with sin. He's calling you to make a move tonight. Make your calling and election sure. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, have me say this last thing. I hate to say it, but I must. Some of you sitting here tonight are going to wake up in hell. Because in spite of the Holy Ghost here, in spite of the Word, 
you allow the enemy to come and pluck it away from you. I want you to resist the devil. Right now, resist him. He'll flee from you. The Bible says he'll get away from you. Say, devil, get away from me. I want the word to get in my heart. I want the word into my heart. And let him deal with you tonight in love. Will you stand, please? Jesus, send the Holy Ghost mightily right now. Settle over this congregation in the balcony here on the main floor and just quietly deal with us now. There's some, Lord, that have turned away from you. But I know that. There are people here tonight that have turned away. There are people, Lord, that you have just arranged to be in this meeting. You've arranged this whole night for this very moment. And now when I give an invitation, Lord, the very fact that you had me preach this must mean that you've already prepared somebody to open their hearts. Reach out, Holy Spirit, now all over this congregation. Bring in the backslider. Bring in those that are running. Bring in those that are cold of heart. Bring in those that are drifting. Bring them home, Jesus. Oh, you said flee from the wrath of God. Run from it. Flee, run as fast as you can. Run from the wrath of God. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to come in your love now. I, I don't want any music. If the Holy Ghost is dealing with you, folks, I don't know why, but I'll know in just a few moments. Up in the balcony in here, get out of your seat. When the Spirit of God touches you and say, Brother Dave, that message is one I had to hear. God's been dealing with me. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come down here right now and say, Jesus, I give it all to you tonight.